Will the partisan bickering in Washington ever end? Former Senator Olympia Snow and Jason Grumet of the Bipartisan Policy Center say it must if the U.S. is to lead and prosper. They'll explain why next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. In Washington, the partisan divide has made it almost impossible to deal with the nation's most pressing challenges. But former Senator Olympia Snow and Jason Grumet, both of the Bipartisan Policy Center, have some ideas on how to help the U.S. regain its course. Welcome to the show, Olympia and Jason. Thank you, John. Pleasure to have you here. Olympia, start us out. Help us understand why bipartisanship is so important to both the domestic and the foreign policy making process. Well, really, John, it's the only way in which it's possible to move legislation forward in the United States Congress um, because you have to work across the aisle. Neither side has sufficient votes to drive the agenda unilaterally. And nor would you want to, frankly, when it comes to the issues that are of paramount concern you know, to the country. You need both sides to be working together. And as we've seen and witnessed, regrettably, in the Congress, is that both sides are unable to work together to reconcile those differences to address critical issues that are on the agenda. You know, whether it's on you know, economic growth and job creation, which is obviously essential to this country. We've seen very subpar economic recovery in the aftermath of the recession. Uh, too few jobs are being created, too few good paying jobs are being created for many Americans who are struggling and looking for work, uh, not to mention overall debt reduction uh, is going to be absolutely vital for the future and for young people uh, going forward too in terms of the debt that they'll inherit from this generation if we don't correct it. We see on the international front what's happening that represents serious threats to our security here as well as abroad. And so the list goes on. And unfortunately, we see a Congress that is in total lockdown uh, with respect to addressing any of the issues. In fact, they're you know sort of hiding from voting on issues. I mean, it, we've seen that just even you know with a recent debate on um, whether or not to provide training and funding and equipping the moderate rebels in Syria. I mean, they had very little debate uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives, the United States Senate. I mean, it's incredible. It was a matter of us, you know, something like you know nine hours in the House and eight hours in the Senate. Uh, I mean, it's just too few hours relegated to one of the most important issues of our time at this moment, and particularly as we go forward. So they're avoiding the votes on, on the key issues. And when you look at the overall you know, issue concerning Medicare and Social Security, very important programs. We need to continue to strengthen you know, them for the future all of which have been ignored. And so if you don't have both sides working together, there's no possibility of moving the country forward. And that's what's happened. And that's why they're not in session, because they've refused to work with the other side. And so bipartisanship is essential in the final analysis. Jason, let's go back to the beginning of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Just briefly, tell sure. us what inspired it and what do you hope to com accomplish in the organization? Well, John, thanks for having us. And your focus on these issues is really Tremendously appreciated. So I started the center about seven years ago with uh, four former Senate Majority Leaders, two Democrats, Tom Daschle and George Mitchell, two Republicans, Bob Dole and Howard Baker. And the essential idea is to try to restore a sense of productive partisanship. So we're not nonpartisan, postpartisan, metapartisan. We believe the country is, in fact, closely divided, ideologically sorted, and that there's a way to be both partisan and effective, which has really been the story of our country. So the staff is aggressively bipartisan. Um, we, you know, my two vice presidents, one used to lobby for the Union of Concerned Scientists, the other for the National Rifle Association. So we are an existence proof that you can have strong, ideologically committed people who are actually willing to listen to one another. And then the one other thing we do is we try to combine you know, aggressive policy work with equally aggressive advocacy. We don't have the imagination that we're going to hit print and the world is going to fall to its knees. And so you know, with the study we've done on political reform or our work on immigration or fiscal policy, we do a lot to try to make sure that Congress actually engages with the proposals. Why don't we focus on that committee on political reform? Tell us 
you know, when sure. it started, when it ended, and then we can get into some of the recommendations. So I can start it out. I think the um, sense we had after doing a lot of what we think was pretty you know, effective policy work was that none of it was gaining real traction. And we really had started to think about the broader structures of the democracy. What we sought to do, which I think is somewhat unique, was to have you know, an aggressively bipartisan approach. Because um, for much of the uh, political reform efforts, there's kind of a center-left inspiration to it. And as Olympia said, we live in a closely divided country. And if you don't have a really meaningful voice on both the left and right, you can put out a great study, but it's not going anywhere. And so the goal was to bring forward a really diverse group, former political leaders, you know, social activists, people who have you know, strong careers in business, and see what we could actually agree upon. Now, tension is built by design into the Constitution, mm -hmm. but we're That's talking right. about a type of tension that represents the extremes. How, how did we get to this point in our political discussions? Well, you know, you raise a, you know, an important issue because I think so often um, people will say, well, you know, it's been worse in our history. And that's true. Uh, you know, we had duels and canings and brawls in the United States Senate, but, you know, back in the 1800s. Uh, but that's not really the standard by which we want to measure uh, the, the Senate or the Congress's overall performance in, in the 21st century. We have, we have to identify those critical issues that are facing the country and reconcile those differences. And the difference today is, which I, uh, is certainly, I uh, think, a marked departure from the past is that people are unwilling to work across the aisle to sort through the differences and to try to understand what does the other side need and how do you address those issues and those differences in a piece of legislation. In the past, you'd have your debates, you'd have your fights, and sometimes they were fears. Uh, but in the final analysis, you're able to reconcile and to bridge those differences. Today, they're unwilling because they want to take it to the next election. Everything's about messaging today. You'll hear a lot about messaging. So whether it's a, a particular vote, whether it's framing an amendment, framing a position, uh, they want to force the other side to take a vote uh, so they can advantage themselves in, in the next election. Then they can use it in a 30-second ad for the next election. So everything's about the next election. So that becomes perpetual. And so there's really no interest in working on the issues because now they get to feed the ideological base that cast their votes in a primary and secondly the outside groups the independent groups that are spending millions and millions of dollars that are influencing these elections now disproportionately so ultimately the whole <laughs> congress in a sense is responding to that rather than figuring out wait a minute we got to work on the issues that matter to the country mm -hmm. but that's not the issue anymore it's about their power base their political base in order to position themselves uh, in the best maximum position uh, to win the next election. I think, John, I think you know, a, another issue to add to that is, you know, we used to be having big fights within the family, and now we're having you know, tribal brawls. It wasn't long ago. You know, the Clinton administration was not exactly a moment of national cohesion mm -hmm. and affection, mm -hmm. right? The government shut down, the contract right. on America, the Lewinsky. We impeached the guy. A few weeks after President Clinton was impeached, he was signing legislation, mm -hmm. which means that while the Congress was actually impeaching the president, they were having committee hearings, they were working together, because we used to know each other. And so that gave the Congress the ability, I think, to metabolize the aggression, which you have to have in a functional democracy. And so really a lot of it comes down to trust. And there are, I think, some things that we could do as a country, realistically, to start to rebuild some of that cohesion and trust within the Congress, not just within the country. And I think, you know, Jason raises, uh an important issue, and that is that um, no matter what the moment was and how bad it was, and you know, mentioning impeachment, and it's true. I mean, there were a number of issues, uh, you know, during the 90s. Uh, you know, I was serving in the Senate my first term. Um, we had a number of different issues, but at the end of the day, we were able to balance the budget mm -hmm. under the Clinton administration with a Republican Congress for the first time in 50 years. I mean, we had three or four years of balanced budgets and surpluses from the first since the 1930s. There's never a notion that you're somehow going to subjugate America's interests for the sake of politics, you know, perpetually. And, and therein lies the difference. And it's because of the outside influences now to the extreme with respect to the money that's being raised in these elections that are running these ads in the hundreds of millions of dollars, will now be in the billions of dollars. 
um, in order to continue to fuel their power base. And so ultimately, we're not serving the interests of the, of the country. That's why we've forfeited you know, so many of the issues mm -hmm. that are sitting on the sidelines. And you don't have the President and the Congress working together anymore. Uh, because now it's all about the next election and how they can make sure that they're not going to be challenged in a uh, primary. Mm -hmm. We seem to be hearing primarily from the extremes, and it worries me because in this country and in other countries for that matter, that big moderate middle, which I think is a reality, tends not to be heard. Why is that, and how can we raise the voice of that moderate yeah, middle? It's a, it's a key insight. I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that we do live in a pretty sordid nation. You know, it's not, you know, redistricting is an issue, but we've kind of organically redistricted ourselves. Mm -hmm. But the way we elect people, I think, adds kind of extremity to that sorting, right? About one out of five registered Americans voted in primaries. When you have 10% on the left and 10% on the right as the electorate, that's a pretty shallow pool, and you get, you know, nothing but the kind of extremity that I think the senator was uh, referring to. So we made a lot of recommendations in our commission to try to broaden voter engagement. You know, an idea that I'm quite fond of is the notion of having a national primary day. Most people don't even know the primaries are happening, let alone making an informed decision not to vote. And certainly during the mid-years, I think that's a real problem. We supported broadly Democrats and Republicans, extended early voting time, proposed a lot of efforts to make the voter lists more effective, like having online registration. It's the 21st century and we're still asking people to go stand at the Department of Motor Vehicles <laughs> to register to vote. And so I think, you know, those issues and approaches take time, but if we could actually, you know, advance the number of people who voted in primaries from 20 percent to 30 percent, mm -hmm. that would have a dramatic impact on the kinds of people who come to Washington. I'd like to get more into the recommendations, but first, help us understand how the commission worked. H how do you explain to people that this really was representative of wide, wide swath of America. Well, uh, there are 20 or 9 of us who served on the commission, and as Jason indicated, on, on both sides, uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats, uh, former office holders uh, from the nonprofit world, from the private sector, from academia, um, a, a veteran, and, you know, who served our country. Uh, so, and we all had very strong held views, uh, very passionate. And we, you know, discussed uh, all of these initiatives, debated them, and ultimately uh, came to uh, the conclusion that 65 different recommendations that we proposed in this report uh, would focus on three critical areas, which was congressional reform, electoral reform, as well as promoting and encouraging uh, public service. We also held four uh, town meetings across the country, beginning with the Reagan Library and the Constitution Center. Ohio State University and, and the Kennedy Library as well uh, to draw in the public uh, and also using social media, getting young people involved and in having these town meetings with the public and examining uh, you know, the causes and consequences of the political divide and what we can do about it. It's one thing to talk about, it, and the, other, the other issue is to solve it. And we can solve it. And we want to encourage people to understand they're empowered to solve it, that they have a place to go and the Citizens for Political Reform movement that we're also creating through our website. We urge people to go there and to see what they can do to implement some of these recommendations. We have very specific ones, and we think can make the difference uh, to break the lock uh, that the polarizing forces have in our political system. Either we decide to change it, or we're going to have to live with this, you know, status quo of uh, hyperpartisanship. John, just a, a two quick thoughts. I mean, one is that you know the bipartisan policy center does not seek out wallflowers. So, you know, we have pretty aggressive, active debates. And as a result, you know, we don't get to agree on everything. So, you know, those 65 recommendations reflect what we could agree on. But, you know, we had big arguments about yeah. money in politics and mm -hmm. voter ID. And so, there, you know, there were issues that we couldn't come to terms in terms of a real consensus about. Um, but we do have a list that we think is meaningfully and kind of politically actionable. Um, the only other thing I would uh, add is that we got to do a lot of things in public and a lot of things in private. We had the ability to have real deliberation where people offered creative ideas, explored ideas that they knew were not consistent with you know, people's expectations of them, and found that kind of collaboration. The Congress has very little opportunity to do that. There's a way in which our desire for constant transparency actually shrinks the opportunity for members of Congress to act in the national interest. 
Why don't we address each of the three clusters you just referenced, starting with uh, electoral reform? You, you touched on primaries. What are some of the other changes that are recommended in the report that would affect the electoral process? Uh, having impartial redistricting commissions, for example, because again, if you look at uh, the U.S. House of Representatives, there are very few remaining competitive seats. Uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center did an analysis uh, back in 2012 and essentially establishing there were perhaps a little 102 competitive seats. Uh, Charlie Cook, a political analyst, saying for this election there may be 12 toss-up. Uh, so they're so homogenized because of the single-party gerrymandering that has sort of, you know, solidified the ideological nature uh, of the problem that we're dealing with. And so therefore, these, these redistricting commissions, if they were established outside of the legislative arena, having the support of both parties, but impartial, you know, and setting up the certain criteria that makes it impartial. So that you have more competitive seats, uh, ultimately, therefore you can have more competition of ideas. Uh, rather than having a lockdown where it's either, either in the Republican camp or in the Democratic camp. And that's ex exactly what's happened, and ultimately you don't have the competition of ideas in the House of Representatives. We also have some congressional reforms, five-day work week, uh, pretty basic but uh, really uh, an imperative. What you said about how we used to make policy really resonated with me, because even if you disagreed during the course of the debate, you understood that consensus was necessary for the national interest, and, and you moved on. But uh, are, are there ways for the two houses to communicate better, and, and for the Congress to communicate better with the president, and vice versa? So the, you know, we have bipartisan issues. We do also have bicameral issues, so in addition to having Congress spend a few weeks in town, that also would align the schedules. We often find that one house is in session mm -hmm. and the other simply isn't, which you know is from a kind of efficiency point, the height of silliness. One other aspect of the recommendations that I think would bring the two houses together is to restore the authority of committees. Congressional committees on both sides of the aisle used to be the engines of our democracy. The people who worked in those committees and ran those committees were partisans, but they were also committed to a subject matter. You know, the people on the Ag Committee cared about agriculture. They were Democrats and Republicans who cared about agriculture in both houses. And to the extent that we have legislation generated at the committee level, as opposed to what's really happening today where the Senate leader and the minority leader really are running the show, um, we have a lot better progress. Because, you know, when the political folks are running the show, as Olympia was saying, they're just focused. I mean, that's their job, right? They want to maintain their majority. They want to keep their job. They're focused on the election. So bringing the committees back into a position of real force would make a big difference. I'd love to keep talking about the proposed congressional reforms, but the, the third area I'd really like to get to because it seems that that's one that we can connect most with at the community level, this, this call to service idea. Uh, tell us about that and what some of the recommendations are. Well, just to you know, get started, I mean, the, the basic premise is that this is a participatory democracy. And if that isn't the case, nothing else matters. We have to find ways to engage people. We did a, a poll, we worked a lot with USA Today, looking at young people's imagination about national service and public service, and found that an overwhelming majority expressed a desire to be part of national service. Um, an overwhelming majority did not think that government work was, in fact, an expression of national service. So we have you know, an imagination of being connected and contributing, but we don't see the country as the you know, opportunity to do that. So we made a suggestion, not a mandatory obligation, but a suggestion that all uh, folks at age 18 spend at least a year in some aspect of mm -hmm. public service. And if the president and the congressional leaders made that a real priority, um, you know, that's a bully pulpit that could start to speak to people. Uh, you know, I think it's essential, and uh, particularly for young people, to encourage them to engage in public service to think about it and to contemplate it and that's why we do recommend uh, you know a year of service uh, between uh, the ages of 18 and um, and 29 to uh, commit to a year of service and to encourage organizations to offer those opportunities to young people whether it's in universities and colleges or uh, nonprofits and foundations uh, so that people can think about the world around them. One of the things that I've discovered, and I did here when I visited the University of Central Florida, as it's been true with so many campuses that I've, you know, been to across the country, young people want to be uh, participating. They want to be involved. 
they just <laughs> very highly skeptical, understandably, about whether or not they want to be in the political arena. And I said, that's the very moment you want to be there because you can change it and they need to change it and understand it. You know, a, the Institute of Politics at Harvard uh, released a poll last spring and it showed that um, the millennials uh, distrust in government and confidence in the government was at a five-year low. Uh, so that's the trend that we want to reverse and through these recommendations and how we can inspire more participation, you know, and looking at so many of the applications that are submitted for AmeriCorps and Peace Corps. I mean, that, you know, there's so much more in demand than uh, is able to be, you know, obliged. But hopefully, you know, that can change too over time. What is the role of education in all of this, both K through 12 and at the university level? So, I mean, you know, obviously, John, it's, it's profoundly important. Um, we, like most groups that focus on good government democracy, we're very committed to the idea of increasing and enhancing civic education. We've all seen the kind of the polls, the jaywalking, you know, where people can't name the vice president of the United States. We did not seek to really create a new curriculum that we would suggest be kind of imposed upon the states because I think the, the K through 12 system is in such challenge right now that you know, figuring out how to bring that information in, in a, I think something we believe that the states are going to have to figure out themselves, which is why you know, we actually believe it has to be in addition to curricular activity. Um, Olympia mentioned that you know, we have an effort called Citizens for Political Reform, which you can find on the Bipartisan Policy Center website. There's a terrific millennial group that we've been working with called Common Sense Action that has chapters on 40 campuses around the country. You know, our sense is it's going to really require that kind of whole civic society engagement. We're probably not going to be able to rely just on the K-12 through system. What is it about the moment we're in that makes you think it's more likely that this kind of reform could happen versus five years ago, ten years ago? Has the pendulum swung so far in the wrong direction that you think it, it's just the moment to start pushing it back? Well, we can't afford to institutionalize, you know, this political culture of dysfunction and scorched earth approach to governing and legislating uh, that is putting the future of this country in, in prosperity and jeopardy and affecting millions and millions of Americans who aren't getting ahead, you know, because of the lagging economy and the inability of Congress and the President working on those issues that matter most it's going to improve the quality of life and standard of living for Americans and for this country moving forward. I mean, the, the legislative inbox is piling up because there are, there, are, there are very few issues that have been addressed by the Congress in, in recent years. And that's what has to change. And this is the moment to change it. Otherwise, we could continue to perpetuate this as the, the norm and the political behavior of our political systems. And, and America can't afford that. And it's not reflective of who we are as, as Americans. Um, so we have to change it now. And that's why it's so important for people to engage and not allow the small, fractious minority to dictate the future of this country. Uh, that's why we can change it. And that's why we offer these specific changes to let people know they actually can do something about it. But we can't afford, more than anything else, to sit on the sidelines. Just, you know, a couple of uh, moments of optimism. One is that the people I've talked to in this country who are the most frustrated with Congress are members of Congress. Mm -hmm. This is not what they signed up for. I mean, it was you know, the job of the senator was described to me by one member as a glorified telemarketer who occasionally gets to vote for an assistant secretary of commerce. So there is a movement within the Congress to start to do things. As Olympia said, you know, we are looking at a very challenging, chaotic, and scary world right now. And so people who used to say government doesn't matter, I think, are starting to reconsider that notion. We still have a long way to go, but we're starting to climb out of that moment of you know, tremendous grief. And I think that creates now the opportunity to start to swing back into something that's a little more productive. Great. Well, Olympia Snow, Jason Grimay, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, John. Thank you for having us. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.